Oh, that sounds like blasphemy. Wendy's gonna hurt the children. I want that man arrested immediately. You can't do that, sir. This is America. Sir, this is a Wendy's drive through uh, All I thing you have to fear is for yourself. Our time. The only salvation is to be good. It's my good to be good. Early Rome was centered around the Etruscans, who were very similar to their neighbors in Greece. Much of what was covered in the presentation on Greece applies to the same time period in Rome. Etruscan art doesn't seem to make any more of a serious effort to occult the magic mushroom from the public view. Popular art includes parasols on stone stellas and artistic frescoes. The Roman headdress is straight out of the mushroom design school of fashion. We also see Roman versions of Greek deities expressed in even more patriarchal ways by promoting ideas of phallicism, which further occult the original meaning of the mushroom symbolism. Priapus was a vegetation deity similar to Dionysus and Bacchus, but now in Rome he had his own cult of followers and was celebrated for his constant erection. When we hear the term phallic worship in the ancient world, for the most part, other than the gay antics of the Greeks and Romans, it was really just a cover for the use of mushrooms. It's well known that Rome invaded Jerusalem in 70 AD, but the reason for this is not so well known. Rome raided Jerusalem for being a drug house. Jewish people were using cannabis, mushrooms, and opiates, and may have even perfected the use of rye grains to harvest LSD. Bethlehem was called the House of Bread for a reason. Coins from this era show that all of these plant medicines were in use, and many times they were featured with the sacred drinking cup, Picantheros. Rome had to deal with a number of different religious sects. They had groves dedicated to gods and goddesses, altars, and areas for the people to appreciate nature. The lands were filled with healing temples of all kinds. When Christianity first sprang forth, it was just like all these other nature religions, but we'll get to that in the next presentation. The caduceus was a long-known symbol for medicine that was originally held by Tehute and other Egyptian healing deities and represented the priest-doctor class. It was a priest-doctor staff later passed down to Hermes and Asclepius in Greece. There are a pair of wings on top representing the bird and a snake coil around it. Once again, bird and serpent symbolism combined together. Some of the earliest Greek versions actually reveal the mushroom. The caduceus secretly represents the magic mushroom, king of all kingdoms, and the primary healing medicine for all mankind. The priest staff evolved in all sorts of ways all over the area where it appears on Roman coins in a variety of shapes and sizes, from 200 to 300 AD, as well as cushioned Indian coins from the same time period. The staff was a symbol of not only medicine, but power as well. Some of the coin depictions around 400 to 450 AD are really odd. Later Byzantine era coins show the staff becoming part of the Christian iconography. Here it became a crozier and shared qualities with the shepherd staff, but still some of them reveal the hidden symbolism of the bird and serpent together. A recurring theme on Roman coins are angels offering halos with serpent symbolism attached. As previously discussed, the halo represents enlightenment through the use of mushrooms or psychedelics, the serpent representing the magic mushroom. Sometimes she's standing in front of an altar shaped like a mushroom, or sometimes just the altars as mushrooms are featured. Angels were messengers from God. The cherubim sit among the clouds. They have bows and arrows, like Cupid. On Roman coins, there are many depictions of angels with skirts that double as mushroom caps, and they all suspiciously sit on one leg like Shiva and the monopedes we reviewed in an earlier presentation. The angel Nike is shown repeatedly in various positions, and sometimes her symbol is used interchangeably with the Roman military standard. This is sometimes depicted with either a serpent or slaves at the base. The Vatican itself is shaped like a mushroom, though some might argue it's the shape of a cross, but I would argue that derives from the mushroom. The popes and cardinals dress in the colors of the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Sometimes the pope dresses like a mushroom in full bloom. There are more than 400 Mithra temples throughout Europe. The old temples of Roman gods and goddesses were destroyed by the superstitious Christians under the direction of the Catholic Church, which knew full well what they were doing, as you can see from these images. They were destroying the old world so they could create a new one. Churches were built up on the grounds of the sacked temples, and many church entrances continue to have mushroom designs built into them. Entrances on the inside of churches represent mushroom symbolism as well. Some of the designs include blue demons with mushroom symbolism, and some of the more interesting images exist in an area called the Villa of the Mysteries, which is probably a spin-off of the Eleusinian Mysteries in Greece. Some of the church art from 1000 AD onward depict mushrooms directly. All of the saints were named from mushroom stories. In fact, the Bible is the greatest psychedelic fairy tale ever told. 
Most of the stories are retellings of older mythological stories based on mushroom characters previously covered, and the church can't hide it anymore because of the internet. These images all come from inside older churches and they never thought they would be exposed to the uninitiated who didn't first become priests within the church. At that time, nobody would have the social context to understand what the church was doing unless they were an insider such as a Jesuit priest. People around the world were not in touch like we are now. The Pope and the Jesuits are finally being exposed for the fraud they've committed for centuries, stealing personal spirituality and replacing it with a paid admission to heaven. Remember who lied to you and who told you the truth. There's lots of people in this world that still believe the story of Adam and Eve as if it was literal. Only the most ignorant and foolish people take the stories in the Bible literally. That's like reading Little Red Riding Hood and believing that wolves sometimes dress up as our grandparents and hide in bed waiting for us at night, or Bugs Bunny defeated Daffy Duck in the Great Battle sometime around A.D. 1976. Children might believe these things, but adults should know better, yet our desires to be comfortable lead us into warm and cozy dungeons of the mind. The tree of life is a representation of the pine tree, which Amanita muscaria mushroom grows in symbiosis with. The base of conifers are the only place you'll find them growing. The fruit of the tree of knowledge is the mushroom. That's the hidden metaphor and symbolism. Both the serpent and the apple secretly represent the magic mushroom. The stories of birds and serpents start in Sumer. The first story of the tree of life comes from the story of Gilgamesh, when the sky god An had carried off the heavens and the air god Enlil had carried off the earth, when the queen of the great below, Arishkagil, was given the underworld for her domain, Enki, the god of wisdom, set sail for the underworld. At that time, a tree, a single tree, the Hulupu tree, was planted by the banks of the Euphrates. The tree was nurtured by the waters of the Euphrates. The whirling south wind arose, pulling at its roots and ripping at its branches until the waters of the Euphrates carried it away. Inanna cared for the tree with her hand. She settled the earth around the tree with her foot. The years passed, five years, and then ten years. The tree grew thick, but its bark did not split. Then the serpent, who could not be charmed, made its nest in the roots of the Hulupu tree. The Anzu bird set its young in the branches of the tree, and the dark maid Lilith built her home in its trunk. At this point, Gilgamesh responds to Inanna's call for help. He entered Inanna's holy garden. Gilgamesh struck the serpent who could not be charmed. The Anzu bird flew with its young to the mountains, and Lilith smashed her home and fled to the wild, uninhabited places." End quote. In the Adapa myth, Inanna eats from a cedar pine tree to acquire knowledge of how to have sex with her bridegroom, Damuzi of Uruk, who later becomes Dionysus in Greece. The fruit of the mess tree at Eridu was called the food of the gods. Inanna was the pre-biblical prototype of Eve. The whole story is nothing more than a fairy tale about opening your mind's eye for the first time and seeing yourself in the world for what it truly is. Being naked is a metaphor for being vulnerable and exposed to light. The enlightened individual can see things now for what they truly are without the moral or social clothing. This concludes the presentation titled, You Can't Unsee It, Episode 666, The Roman Empire and the Catholic Church. For more information on this subject, visit ancientpsychedelia.com and check out the free online version of the book, Ancient Psychedelia, Alien Gods and Mushroom Goddesses. Thanks for watching. One last thing I should mention, if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to support me in my work, here are several ways you can do that. It does help tremendously, and I really appreciate it.